the DH-110 Sea Vixen was powered by two Rolls-Royce Avon engines, each delivering 7,500 pounds of thrust, allowing it to break the sound barrier in a shallow dive and making it the first ever two-seat fighter to do so. It was famous amongst Navy men for its twin boom tail and unconventional cockpit layout where the navigator sat in darkness, concluding inside the fuselage body. Welcome to the de Havilland Aircraft Museum. Part of the mission of the museum is to share with current and future generations all the innovative work that de Havilland did and their contribution to the aviation industry. In order to do that, we've got teams of people who are working on maintaining, renovating and restoring exhibits such as this wonderful Sea Vixen that's behind me. And today it's my privilege to be joined by a couple of members of the Sea Vixen team, Ray and Rob are currently doing some work on this aircraft. So guys, welcome to the channel. Thank you. And uh, Rob, can you tell me a little bit about what you're actually working on now? Well, we're working on, on the Sea Vixen. Um, we decided to put a team together to yeah. uh, see what we could do because it's been out here quite a while, since uh, 1976 when the museum acquired it. And uh, the weather has taken its toll on it. So what we decided to do is to rub it down um, a coat of primer undercoat and then two coats of uh, gloss on top which is like the Royal Navy colour and to that end we've been sponsored by Dulux who donated all the paint with Rodels who donated the scaffolding for us perfect and also uh, MCM print media they've decided to donate the signs so is there any chance we could have a look on the scaffolding and have a closer look yeah we can go, we can go up top but um, you will have to put on the appropriate health and safety gear so standing up here on the scaffolding makes me realise just how big this uh, this plane was, Rob. Yeah, it's it's amazing. This say so this is a view that not many people are going to see. So yeah. you know we're we're quite pleased to be able to see it. But when you think this aircraft, it's what wingspans fifteen and a half metres. Wow. Length seventeen metres. So it's it's a very large aircraft. Um, but also what you can see while you're up up here is the stages of uh, our restoration. Yeah when you see the centre of the fuse large and the outside of the wings, that's what we're starting with. Right. Um, it, it, so that's the effect of many years worth of out being outside, yeah? Yeah, yeah. That's, so as I said before, it's been here since 1976, so that's 48 years of wow. the English weather. But, and when you look at it, as I said before, it, it's, it's pretty good. Um, on the on the port boom there, you can see that's where we've rubbed down. Yeah. Um, that's got uh, one, one coat of undercoat uh, primer on it. But on the tailplane over here, top coat on that, so there's another two to go on it. But once that's smoothed off, another two coats, you're going to see that's what the overall finish is going to be like on the airframe in the entirety. In the entire thing, yes. Yeah. So there's a couple of features of this plane that are pretty unusual as far as I'm concerned. Um, we've got the mechanism down there. Presumably, is that where the wings would fold? Yeah, that, yes, that's the wing folding mechanism there, yeah. We've, we've lost the covers, we're going to have to remanufacture those to cover that over when we carry okay. on with our restoration. Yeah, but they were uh, hydraulic uh, wing folds uh, for use on the aircraft carrier. Okay. Um, the extended wing booms. Yeah, so these are strange because these are booms that extend beyond the front of the wing. Um, I've not seen that in any other aircraft up to now, so what, why, what's the thinking behind that? Well, well these, these booms, uh, they've got uh, increased avionics, increased right. uh, fuel load, and there is a a rumour that in the star, starboard one there was extra luggage for the crew. Okay. So, <laughs> then whether that's been proved or not, we don't know. But uh, there, there is a rumour. Okay. And also, it was, uh, you can't see from where we're standing, but over, over on the wing there, there's a, a flight refuelling probe. So this aircraft was uh, able to be uh, refuelled in flight, which will obviously increase its range, its operational capability. So up here on the scaffolding, uh, my first reaction looking at the nose area is this was a, a single-seater fighter, but the cockpit's all very offset. So, so what's happening here then, Rob? Um, well, from certain angles, uh, it does look like it's a, a single-seat aircraft, but in fact it's not. Yeah. Obviously offset to port, we've got the, uh, the pilot's cockpit, uh, you can see with a canopy. Um, but here, uh, we've got the observer's area under this hatch and you must be very careful in the navy they are observers but inside there is very very dark and black because he needs the 
no ambient light, be able to see his radar screens. And it's commonly called the coal hole. Total darkness flying around, nearly uh, supersonic and in the dive and stuff like that. So I imagine it was, uh, you, need, you need to be the right stuff to do it, I think. Yeah. And um, we've actually put a, a name on it, Lieutenant uh, Roger Young. Yes. Um, he's an ex-serviceman and he comes into visitors and he actually flew in this aircraft. Wow. I think he's actually recorded what it was like to be in yep. the coal hole, right? Yes. The wings would be folded, obviously, when you were parked. As you taxied up, you spread and locked the wings. You then uh, moved onto the catapult. The bridle was attached. When the flag went down, the catapult fired and you were whoosh off in less than two seconds. You were from naught to about 130 miles an hour. Three or four G was uh, the force. You couldn't really do anything and uh, you would climb away quite quickly. High level interceptions, we would climb up to 45,000 feet. The initial rate of climb was about 12,000 feet a minute. You could get up to 40,000 feet in uh, four minutes. It's a fascinating aeroplane. The more you learn about it, uh, the, the more fascinating it becomes. Um, I must uh, have a word with Ray to get a bit of an idea of the history in the background. So it's an incredible aircraft in many respects. Yeah. What's the background to this then, Ray? I guess it all started after World War II when uh, the Royal Navy decided they needed some sort of decent fighter that they could get off their aircraft carriers, um, but they had very specific uh, requirement. Yep. For a start, they said it had to be fast. Uh, it had to be a two-man crew because one man had to deal with the radar and the uh, electronics equipment on yes. board. So that's so, a huge jump forward from what we saw earlier. Absolutely. We saw the Vampire, we saw the Venom. This was just a real step change from absolutely. that. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is uh, one hell of a machine. The other thing I've noticed about this aircraft, I'm looking for the gun ports, the, no the Venom. Guns. No guns? No guns. This is missiles only. Right? Yep. So this is the early days of saying, you know, we're going to use, you know, Absolutely. fire streak and things like that. Absolutely. To... And we do have um, on our exhibition, we do have a, a commentary from a guy who was the observer in this. And he tells you how they fired and how quick they were. We had fire streak missiles. You had to come in behind the aircraft uh, because it picked up the heat from the jet engines. The Mark II Sea Vixen, which you've got here, did have red top missiles, which you could fire from a head on position. But I noticed this exhibit over here, uh, which looks a little bit different. My, my first reaction was, this must be an extra fuel tank, but there's obviously something more happening here. Talk to me about this, Ray. Uh, this is a Palouste engine starter. Uh, it's a French design, built under license here by Rolls-Royce. And the idea is that it has a, a turbine inside, gas turbine, runs at 33,000 RPM, pushes out compressed air, up into the engines to spin the engines as part of their startup procedure. The reason it's this shape is because you turn it 90 degrees and it can be hung underneath the wing so that you can take it with it to anywhere where their starter isn't available and it has its own starter on board. So you've got your own starter system. You take your starter with you. Take your starter yeah. with you. Thank you very much to Ray and to Rob and indeed all of the people on the team that are actually responsible for restoring this magnificent aircraft. We hope you've enjoyed this particular video. Do like and subscribe. Uh, let us know any comments. If you've got any questions, we do read any of the comments on YouTube. Check out our website for when we join, when we're available, uh, and come down and see us and have a look at the progress we're making on the Sea Vixen over the next few months. See you at the museum.